Okay. So welcome to the one of the last calls for today. So my name is Nobel Weinrod. I'm working at Open Exchange as a senior platform architect, and we are running on OpenStack our own software that we are operating in. So first, some words what Open Exchange actually is. So Open Exchange is a software company, and we started as a company providing software to hosting providers and telecommunication, telecommunication providers. And this software was a webmail and collaboration platform. Some years ago, um, we identified the need of operating that stuff ourselves. So in 2013, we started to um, selecting and looking out and for a service provider or a, a provider which can provide us an infrastructure as a service uh, where we can build up onto our stuff. And so finally, we selected then uh, an, a German-based company which is named Exion, uh, which was running OpenStack at this time and based on Havana, and we started then beginning of 2013 to build up our environment there. Um, so there's a, there's a quite low numbers of users, so only 100,000 users we had back then planned for running that service, um, but it was growing. So in 2015, um, we expanded our user base by 300,000 users, so which meant we needed to grow uh, also resource-wise, and we started also to look out for another company in our US, because there we also identified customer needs in the US that customer us to also have a service providing weeks as a service to them in, in the US. Um, and also then we had the first more or less learning from OpenStack open there we experienced the need of migrating to a new OpenStack cluster because the uh, currently running or back then running Havana cluster was not upgradable by the provider. So we had to shift our um, load workload to another cluster. By 2016, we grown tremendously by putting on another 2 million users in our European platform, and we started to build out uh, the US environment uh, as we found a new provider. In the US, we are cooperating there with Rackspace, which are providing us a OpenStack platform as a private cloud environment, as a dual site configuration. And uh, so we started there, we did some significant tests, and. Uh, and started then in 2017 to actually uh, bring on also in that environment another number of users, about 4 million users in the US, and we hit the next requirement of moving over to a new OpenStack cluster in the EU, uh, which is not finished yet, but that is our whatever is, what we are doing. And now in 2018, we have grown to overall 10 million users in our European and US environment, and also start now there for, for a specific reason in the US to migrate into a new OpenStack environment. Reason there is that uh, there were some customizations done for us in that environment, especially to the integration with the Swift object storage, which we're using. And as we are migrating away from Swift because it's not fulfilling our performance needs we need here, uh, we decided to not adapt all the changes to a new OpenStack release, but rather try to migrate over to a new OpenStack plane and get rid of all the customizations we had there. So, so far we have overall in our US and European environment together as provisioned resources and also used resources, about 10,000 cores and 37 terabytes of RAM and operating there with our 10 million users. So what were actually le lessons we learned during all the time coming from a quite low system with only a few amount of users growing to 10 million users. So in regards to network, for example, we learned quite early that uh, throughput connections, so 10 gigabits connection on the hypervisor level does not mean that you're actually able to reach these 10 gigabit connections because we had the problem of, of packet loss. So if they are coming a lot of packets in, which was running fine in the beginning, but once we grown to a certain extent in our environment, with connections coming in from users and also our internal connections, so especially we experienced problems here with DNS resolution, um, there were packet loss. And we, we detected it by seeing that the uh, packets were lost between the hypervisor and the VM. So the packets were reached, uh, received by the hypervisor, but the VM just dropped it somewhere, so it got lost in between. 
Another problem we hit also in our environments is the contract limits, just by the way of the software is working on our side. Um, where also sometimes it was missing the proper monitoring for that. And uh, that led, for example, to intermittent connection problems. So mostly our monitoring, internal monitoring, was not able to reach the VMs while they were still running and doing something. So we were quite puzzled what's actually happening now. And we found out that it was a problem of the uh, contract limit on the hypervisors because we make use of security groups, which is part of our security infrastructure inside our environments. And then also we learned uh, by accident. So for our load balancer needs, for example, we need to provision um, ports with the address pair of 40 slash zeros, just to have the ability to have these VMs sending any IP packets through the backend services. And there you need to be very careful when it comes to using ports which are belonging to a security group and use this security group as a remote security group in another security group because that will lead to uh, that VMs which are using these security groups can be open to almost everyone because it's, it's using the 000 as, as a filter there. And finally, when it comes to network, what we as of now still are experiencing are problems when it comes to hypervisors being restarted and that can lead to the security groups being not fully populated. So there is only uh, the networks partially working. So for example, the, usually the VMs waiting for DHCP coming in so that the IP address is probably configured. Still, the other connection types are not allowed yet because it's still being set up on the environment and we are tr trying to find out how to optimize these. On the hypervisors, actually, we also faced some interesting things. Um, for example, selecting the proper CPU governor. So initially, in all our environments, CPU governor on the default was running with the on-demand governor. And somewhere when there is a certain load on the VMs, the VM started and also our system started to behave quite oddly, I would say. So it means that the um, connections seem to be longer than usual, some connections seem to drop, and other things which are stuffed. And uh, once we have set in all our environments the uh, CPU gun over to performance, all these problems were gone and the VMs were acting as we expected them to be. And the second one, when it comes for us in our, CP, in our load uh, environment, is that we are providing email as a service, which means that we are having backend services where there is some cache data of the user's email, while the email actually stored on a object storage. Um, there is quite some high I.O. demand, and if you are not selecting the proper um, provisioning of the local ephemeral disk, it has a severe performance impact. So OpenStack lessons directly, so that was, I think, which applies to more uh, virtualization environments, but on the OpenStack side, at least what we learned during our five years we have there is that, for example, initially we, in both environments we started for authenticating towards the object storage to use the Keystone service. And with our use case, um, we, e we easily were able to break that Keystone service for various reasons. Um, we did some optimizations in the US environments because in the US environment we are uh, using Swift and it was quite complicated to, to remove the Keystone binding from Swift. So their Rackspace at least did some optimizations so there the Keystone service is able to run with our load we are producing there. We did some optimizations on our side. In the EU then our provider was able to remove the Keystone authentication. And uh, as we are using there, for example, the Ceph storage as an object storage, um, so the Ceph base is now the authentication, so we are not using Keystone anymore. What we also learned, and as you have seen one of the initial slides, that the OPSEC upgrade so far seems to be very difficult. All the promises we got so far from our providers that in the future things will be better. For us, it's quite a challenge to move over the workload because we are providing the email service and, the, and also the webmail service to other providers which have the expectation that the system is always up and running. And moving over and disabling stuff is quite a complicated task. So we have to find solutions how we can 
move over workload step by step and finally get rid of the old control plane. And also one of the last things here is when it comes to OpenStack, as it allows to build things in different ways and we are going with two different uh, companies. So the company in the, in the EU and the company in the US for providing all the service, also the environments will build a bit different. And there we need to be careful when deploying things that things might not work as in the other environment. So that was what we have learned so far, but overall I say it's good to have partners on board where, which are proficient in OpenStack and know what they are actually doing. So we do, can focus on using OpenStack as an environment to build our software on top of it. So that was all, thank you.